the Krakow, the Poulen, the pointy medieval shoe popular in Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries, controversial in its time and upheld since as a high point of sartorial ridiculousness. Like many before me, when I see the Krakow, I can't help but think, why is this not made of fish? Today I'm showing off my medieval turn shoes made from salvaged carp leather. This project is far from artisanal shoemaking and is absolutely more in the costumey DIY Ren Fair sort of realm, but I'll still do my best to explain how my novice improvisations may differ from original medieval shoemaking practices. Finally, before we dive in, I need to say that there is zero actual evidence for a fish leather Krakow ever having existed, but I really wanted there to be, so I did a lot of research and I compiled some amusing arguments, along with some slightly disturbing things I learned about medieval leather. I'll share those with you toward the end of this video. First, some background. The words Poulen or Krakow actually just refer to the long pointed toe of a shoe. This style emerged at the end of the 14th century, but became really extreme in the 15th century. The 14th century is often cited as the period when regularly changing fashion really became a thing in Western Europe. In menswear, that meant short skirts and pointy shoes, and not everyone was pleased. The points on shoes could reach two feet in length, and they were seen by many as excessive, if not outright obscene. Several states passed laws restricting the poulen. Medieval sumptuary laws are often about reinforcing class boundaries and Christian morality through dress, but this 1463 English statute is very much about economic protectionism as well. It's interesting to me that this statute tangles up ideas of displeasing God with the destructive economic influence of cosmopolitan fashions. There are many other restricted items in this law, so it's not clear if the protectionism is at all about the shoes, but I thought it was worth noting. The commons of this realm have worn and daily do wear excessive and inordinate array and apparel to the great displeasure of God and impoverishing of this realm and to the enriching of other strange realms and countries to the final destruction of the husbandry of this said realm. No knight under the state of a lord, esquire, gentleman, nor other person shall use nor wear any shoes or boots having pikes passing the length of two inches upon pain to forfeit to the king for every default, three shillings and four pence. Footwear is mostly not gender specific, but Poulen shoes do seem to be a bit of an exception to this rule. Images of women's shoes from the time often just show really small points. Something something, Freud something something. I opted to keep my points fairly modest because these shoes were going to have enough design elements going on as it was. The impetus for this project was that I had on my hands more carp leather than I knew what to do with. It was cheap dead stock that I bought online one night for some reason. It is old and unfinished and very dry, crispy, and wrinkled. Fish leather can be really beautiful and has been used to make shoes by various cultures around the world. While those shoes were one of the sources of inspiration for this project, mine really aren't going to have much to do with those traditions that are mostly that I kind of wanted to make some medieval shoes and I had a bunch of fish leather. Before doing anything with the leather, I needed to figure out how my shoes were going to go together. There are many examples of Poulen shoes in museums all over Europe that I could theoretically have taken inspiration from. However, just because an archaeological find exists doesn't mean there's accessible information on it. There is one awesome set of publications on medieval finds from York that has a ton of detailed data but also is written in a really accessible way and has lots of pictures and diagrams. It's such a good resource and you can read it online for free. 10 out of 10. Would recommend. Anyway, in this volume they describe some Poulen shoes. Poulen shoes were usually turn shoes, which means they were constructed inside out and then flooped right side out so the seams are hidden. They are made with a leather sole and a two-piece leather upper consisting of a vamp and quarters. They are fastened with either a buckle and strap or a tied latchet that is attached either to the vamp or to the quarters. The upper is cut low at the sides and the sole is cut with a very narrow waist as was sort of fashionable at the time or was just the way of making shoes. 
and of course a pointy toe stuffed with moss to keep its shape. So this is the general look that I'm going for, but there are a ton of variations on this theme, so things might shake out a bit differently. To make a pattern, I used the definitely period tape method. I taped up my foot with masking tape. I then used a marker to draw on my foot where I wanted the upper to meet the soles and where I wanted the pieces of the upper to be cut. I carefully cut the tape off of me, then cut along the stitch lines. This gave me the rough shape of the pieces I'd need, which I then traced to get the pattern for my mock-up. My mock-up was made with some heavy canvas left over from a performance piece I did in art school. I cut the pieces out with a half inch seam allowance just so that I could easily sew my mock-up on a machine. The seam allowance on the final shoes would be different depending on whatever stitches and construction methods I decided to use. I didn't bother getting the toe right because I knew that part was going to be finicky and weird anyway. It fit well enough so I picked the seams and used the mock-up to draft a final pattern with some slight changes. I had a hard time figuring out how to restore this stuff or if it was even possible because most of the information I could find was geared toward people who want to take really good care of really nice leather rather than me who just wants to breathe a wretched semblance of life into these dried up husks. So I improvised and I'm sure I did a lot of blasphemous things. I used vinegaroon to dye my leather. It's an old fashioned iron based leather stain that reacts with the tannins in the leather to produce a strong inky black. Tannins are astringent compounds found in oak bark and other plant sources and they were the key ingredient in processing medieval leather. Leathers produced with plant tannins are called vegetable tanned, and they are still widely in use today. My leather, however, is probably chrome tanned, which is a modern industrial tanning method. It doesn't have any tannins in it for the vinegaroon to combine with, so I decided to fake it by soaking my leather in a bath of tannin-rich sumac first. I then painted on the vinegaroon, which is a solution of vinegar and iron nails. This hell beast woke me up at four in the morning. So, as you can see, these are looking quite light gray, but they have changed a lot from the original. After we condition it, I think it'll get a fair bit darker. I don't usually see paraffin wax in recipes for this, but it was in the bottom of my craft pot. I didn't want to clean it, so there's about one part paraffin, one part beeswax, and two parts safflower. Alrighty, so I have my pieces of fish leather ready to go now. I think they are absolutely terrifying. They look like something you could maybe make like an orc cod piece out of. But like, look how far we've come. This is actually like leather. I'm just gonna go ahead and make the shoes now, I think. I had to cut the pattern down the center of the vamp so that it would fit on my skins. Even still, I clearly had a hard time laying everything out and I didn't dye nearly enough for my shoes to even have soles, but those aren't going to be seen anyways, so I just greased up a couple extra pieces for the soles off camera and left them undyed. Also, the paraffin in my conditioner turned out to be a bad call. It left all those little white specks and I couldn't buff them off because the scale pockets are too fragile. 
They did come off eventually as I worked the shoes though, so it was fine in the end, but if I did it again, I would use an emulsified oil conditioner, like egg yolks or brains. I stitched up the divided vamp and then began figuring out how everything else was gonna fit. Medieval shoes were assembled and fitted on wooden shoe forms called lasts. I made a weird makeshift one by covering my foot with tape just like before, and I filled the form with cornmeal. This gave me a foot-like thing that was the volume of my foot, but it could be smooshed into a slightly different shape which would make it easier to stitch that narrow waist of the sole. And while I liked this idea, I ended up only using it as a guide for the fit and just stitching everything together on the table. For the upper, I just used normal running back stitches. Normally leather is stitched by pre-punching your stitch holes with an awl and then using a needle or even a boar bristle to do the sewing. My leather was thin enough though that I didn't need an awl, but I did use this clip thing to help me pull the needle through when it got stuck and it was pretty slow going. I then packed up all my belongings, said a few goodbyes, and moved across the continent. Look at me. Look at me. Okay then. Bye. I must go. You're not fooling anyone. There's too many cats in this house. Now that you've come this far on the journey with me, I think you deserve some answers, some theories, some facts spewed at you in quick succession. Over the course of some meandering research, I compiled some arguments that support the plausibility of fish leather poulens, and honestly, much better arguments against. So I'll share those with you now, but if six minutes of crackpot theories about something ultimately really inconsequential is not what you're here for, skip ahead to the next timestamp where I will hopefully be finishing these shoes. One, fish were plentiful. They were a huge part of the medieval European diet. The Catholic Church back then was really into asceticism and they wanted people to abstain from earthly pleasures as much as possible, particularly during Lent and other religious days, which was like every other day. Part of this meant not eating meat on these days so as to not arouse your carnal passions, but you could eat fish because fish are not as sexy as beef. Not everyone observed these rules, but records show that monasteries and noble households ate absolutely massive amounts of fish. And if you're going through so much fish, it seems like there would be a bunch of fish skins around. Two, they had the technology. Leather was an important material in medieval times, so tanning fish skin was well within the reach of medieval technology. There are some differences in tanning processes depending on what animals' hides you're using, but I don't think this would have been a barrier because... Number three. There's some evidence that they didn't discriminate too much when it came to hide species. In late medieval Europe, bovine leathers were the most popular, followed by sheep, but those were also just the most plentiful and important animals around at the time. Cattle were hugely important. They were used not only for meat and dairy, but also they were vital draft animals. And sheep wool was one of the most important commodities in all of Europe at the time. The next popular leathers were pig and goat, and then we don't have a lot of other extant pieces of leather. But what we do have are the bones. The bones of fairly diverse species have been recovered at the sites of medieval tanneries, as well as in other places but with marks consistent with having been skinned or otherwise processed for hide use. Deer, wild boar, horse, and pretty much any other common domestic or game animal are all represented in these spines which of course also includes a healthy amount of cat and dog remains. Cat skins especially seem to have been harvested for their fur. This is actually supported too by documentary evidence of the exportation of cat pelts from England to the continent, and at least one mass harvest of urban cats. And I haven't seen an indication that cat furs were a prestige item. Rather, it just seems that they were a replacement for costlier furs, 
While we're talking about fur here and not leather, I think the general principle of use what's available even if it's the skin of an animal kind of suggests that Fish leather might be absent from the archaeological records simply because it breaks down quicker. I don't really know why, but I read it in a paper, so there. Archaeologists may be biased toward bovine and caprine sheep leather. Why would you pull something out of the ground and assume it's something else? I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that there are probably more bits of horse hide and dog in museum basements than they're aware of. Six? These shoes are part of the traditional crafts of nearby peoples. The Sami, it's pronounced Sami, as well as the Icelanders, have at least recently made fish leather shoes. In Iceland, this tradition probably goes back at least to the 17th century. I've seen one claim that it was brought to Iceland by the Vikings, but I haven't been able to back that up at all. Perhaps they were part of a wider tradition of fish skin use that extends to other parts of Europe. Additionally, I feel like I might be missing out on a whole bunch of research since I only speak English. There may well be fish skin pulen shoes hiding in Danish and Icelandic databases. Anything is possible. Which segues us nicely to... The arguments against. First, take a little breather. Refresh your tea. One. There's no extant examples of medieval fish leather. Pretty simple. Two, cows and sheep were also plentiful, and unprocessed hides probably weren't a particularly hot commodity. Especially in the 14th and 15th centuries, the population of humans in the region was reduced quite a lot following the Black Death, so the ratio of humans to useful animals was probably quite high on the human side. Unconventional large animals like deer seem to have been processed a fair bit for their hide, but a small fish just might not really have been worth it. Number three, there's no documentary evidence. And there's no documentary evidence for a lot of day-to-day -day aspects of life in the Middle Ages, so that's not too weird. What gets written down is mostly about kings and Romans and anti-Semitism. But since we've established that there likely wasn't a demand for any and all animal skins for the supply of leather, it follows that if fish skins were used at all, it would have been for their unique fishy properties. Aesthetic uses might show up in art then, and technical uses might show up in inventories or technical texts. And as far as I can tell, they don't. The closest I've seen is a reference to Merlin wearing a doublet of snakeskin. Actually, I don't know if the snakeskin jacket belongs to Merlin or Arthur or someone else in the story. I can't read Middle English, so I don't really know what's going on here. Number something. Local traditions seem to be specific to the North. Iceland has a strong tradition of fish shoes, but these shoes are reportedly rawhide, which just would not hold up at all in the mud. The Sami Sami have also traditionally made fish shoes, and I don't know the details of those because frankly, I just sort of hit a wall, and I don't even like reading, so I don't want to do it anymore, and I'm gonna make these shoes no matter what. So my verdict as a volunteer professional amateur historian is probably fish skin pulens were not a thing. The stitching of the soles is where things really diverge from bespoke cord waning, if you somehow don't think they have already. In the York finds, a few different leather stitches are used to attach the soles, but they are all edge stitches, meaning the leather is thick enough for the stitch hole to go through the cut edge of the leather. My leather is way too thin for that, so I just continued along with a running back stitch sort of a thing. But I do recommend checking out Nicole Rudolph's Medieval Shoes because she's an actual knowledgeable historical shoemaker. And then came the flooping, which I've heard is more dramatic and challenging with thicker leather, but these turned no problem. I stitched on a latchet, and that was that. While I like to make fun of myself for being former art school trash, I do appreciate the lessons I learned there. One lesson is that making is a kind of thinking. When you make something, you enter into a kind of conversation with the world, and that conversation going somewhere worthwhile has less to do with the validity of the idea you start with and more to do with how open you are to keeping that conversation going.
This project started kind of as, wouldn't it be funny if I did this? But through spending the time and doing research and experimenting materially, I learned different things about medieval culture than I might have if I just reconstructed something the right way. One important part of the history of this period that I hadn't really thought of before is the dialectic between medieval Christian asceticism and early modern flamboyance. In the medieval context, fish were really representative of that traditional Christian set of customs, while shoes were the site of the new frontier of secular culture to such an extent that they were even legislated against. And these are stupid, not very useful, not historically accurate shoes, but it's nice that they contain all that. <laughs>